Welcome back everyone, this is the State of the Nation. Now, last week alone, over seven protests against the increase of taxes on income. If only we could learn from the past and understand that we are applying the same butter on the same toast with the same jam. And basically, we are getting the same jam sandwich, despite us wanting to get a steak sandwich. Masikava, Rupel, Hatta the Haspanse, Kata Badi, Molika Vatupak Upe in a putgalinte, Pasuke Kale di, Baduvi Matase the Wunamut, Mevara, Silu Dimana Sahita, Masikava, Rupel Lakshi Katavada Upean Nenam, Nava Iwe Yojana and Ver Baduvi Matase the Wunavak, Rupel Lakshatis Hat Vadi, Varshika Adai Makhimikam Kena Putgalik, Molika Lakshu Dulaha Harunubita, Vadi Vena Lakshu Visi Hatarata Vadi, Sam Mudalaks and the Hammer, Say at a Visi Hataraka Badu Pratishatak, Raja to Gavi to Baba, Nava Badu Sancho than a Yojana Valas and the Hunt. Did you think that was about taxes being implemented right now? I'm sorry to say that was a clip, a news clip back from 2015, meaning this same formula was implemented back in 2015. And just like what we showed you on the data board, the result of the nation's growth will surely decline. Expect that very soon to happen. The IMF solution is to tax the people, increase the government's profits and balance the primary account. Does this work? Joining me now is the Assistant Professor of Economics at the New School for Social Research in New York, Professor Clara Matei. She joins me now via Zoom uh, from New York. Professor Matei recently authored the book, The Capital Order, How Economists Invented Austerity and Paved the Way to Fascism. So firstly, Professor, thank you very much for taking the time. Uh, good to see you. Now, the current solution to Sri Lanka's crisis, which the IMF has proposed, is to increase taxes and basically kill the middle class. According to you, Prof, is that going to work? Many thanks. Um, will it work? This is uh, the way of posing the question that we should start challenging in the sense that austerity will work uh, for those in power, for the wealthy, for the few, and it will not work uh, for the majority, for well, the well-being of the Sri Lankans, for the for the two, 22 million people in rural areas who are struggling to put food on the table as it is right now in, in your country. So this is the big question, is to really be able to repoliticize the message coming from these supposedly very technical and authoritative institutions like the IMF. The message of economists uh, advising governments is not a neutral message. It is cloaked as a non-political science, as something above part that has the objective truth of everyone. But really, we know that what they're aiming at is shifting resources from the majority to the minority. So... The proposal of uh, increasing taxes on the majority is very symbolic, emblematic of the real project of austerity because regressive taxation is a kernel of the austerity package. Regressive taxation means that while the few are taxed less, the money comes from the sacrifice of the majority. So I know now they're trying to increase the, uh, the, the, the they're trying to increase the pool of who's being taxed to cover the the poor and at the same time they're um really also increasing the cost of ultimately of indirect taxation because they're taking away subsidies and it becomes more costly to actually purchase the common necessities so we see here that fiscal austerity in the form of form of regressive taxation is one of a very important series of policies that serve to disempower the people, to silence the demands for social change. Uh, indeed, um, that's very much uh, enlightening uh, of what you said. Uh, Professor, now, uh, since, uh, I'm pretty sure you have witnessed a negative impact on countries uh, through austerity, which you have clearly outlined in your book. Now, my reference is uh, specifically to emerging economies like Sri Lanka. 
Why would organizations such as, this is, this is the biggest question that I have, why would organizations such as the IMF propose such hefty cuts on public spending and hikes in um, government revenue? What, what is the reason that they keep saying this over and over again when we really know it won't work in countries like Sri Lanka? Cuts in public spending is the other face of the medal of fiscal austerity. We talked about increasing regressive taxation. And the second part is the state cutting, especially on social expenditures. So once more, what is being done is the urge to increase the market dependence of the majority, increase the precariousness of the population. So they depend more and more on money in their pocket in order to survive because it you you cut public schools public uh, uh, public um health care public transport this will all make it such that we will be more and more forced as the majority to go and work for a low wage in order to make a living so this is really what austerity is good at this is how austerity is successful it's successful at making sure that the majority accepts their condition as exploited wage workers. Um, and so this is what we really need to realize is that once more, austerity is not a neutral necessity. It's not a recipe that we should just take for granted as something that it will do the good of the whole. It is doing the good of foreign creditors. Right? The IMS is, IMF is playing the advocacy of those who will gain by having Sri Lankans take money from their pocket and through taxes, ultimately ending up in the uh, large international institutions who lend money to the country. Indeed, um, very much uh, uh, in agreement. Uh, Professor, uh, if austerity is not the solution, then what is the solution? How can a country facing such a complex economic crisis like Sri Lanka is facing right now overcome it? Thank you. So I wrote the capital order that I have right here um, to historicize what I've been saying so far. Um, I show concretely how austerity is not just a problem of the south of the globe. It's actually a recipe that is played within uh, the north to kill political upheavals and alternatives to economic democracies that were emerging, for example, after the First World War in 1919. So once we realize, as I do, and as I explain very clearly in my book, that austerity is about silencing alternatives, um, what we need to do is actually be more imaginative about these alternatives, right? So while austerity serves to basically curtail our political imagination, the first opposition from us has to be to actually avoid naturalizing capitalism as the austerity dogmas has us do. Capitalism, the capitalist market economies are not the only way we can run society. It's a very young economic system. Advanced capitalism is really only have been on the planet for 0.1% of the time human beings have been on earth. And for the rest of the time already in the past, but potentials in the future, we can really reimagine gaining agency as producers, bringing back the democratic decision making in the production process, in the agricultural, agriculture, in industry. So I think what Sri Lanka needs is really to say stop to this dependence from foreign investors and take back economic sovereignty, putting at the center, though, no, not the elite in the country, but the people, right? Um, because the elite of the country, of course, are playing the game of the international elite, of the elite in the North. So we need to take back ownership of our means of production and organize production democratically. There is a lot of this being done in the peasantry in Sri Lanka. I have a good student of mine who actually studies these processes and how actually these, these um, self-governing councils in production are also much more ecologically sustainable in a moment in which we are facing a climate catastrophe. So I would say I would give voice to the people, go and explore what is actually happening and make this into a new movement that says enough 
of thinking that we can only have capitalism and there is no alternative. There are alternatives. And my book shows very well the many alternatives that had emerged after the First World War and how austerity, of course, constantly functions to defeat these alternatives. And this is why we need to read it as what it is, not as a neutral message, but as a political unilateral war, one-sided war against the people that comes from the elite of the globe and that needs to be opposed. Indeed. Uh, well, we have to leave it at that. Thank you very much. Uh, that was Professor of Economics at the New School for Social Research in New York, Professor Clara Mate. Appreciate your time, Professor. Let's take a short commercial break. This is State of the Nation. Back in a moment.